First, a little bit about me. Um, my Twitter handle is Cup of Joseph. Uh, I've worked on crypto projects with Consensus, Gitcoin, OpenSea, Decentraland, Airbus, Storage. Maybe you've heard of some of those projects or companies. Um, they're cool. And uh, my favorite book is Dune. I really like Cherry Garcia ice cream. My favorite dogs are Huskies, which is great. I've seen a lot of Huskies in Denver so far today, so that's good. And uh, this weekend, I'm going to be hacking at ETH Denver, so I hope that you will join me and do that too. Uh, so today, we're going to talk about our overview is going to include what is a collectible, what's an ERC, because people like to throw around a lot of acronyms and not actually explain what the acronym means. We're going to talk about fungible. There were some people talking about fungibility and stuff over here a minute ago. And then we're going to have plenty of time for coding. And actually, everyone, hopefully, at the end of this workshop will have implemented their own ERC721 token and be ready to deploy it. Uh, we're not going to do deploying today, but I can help with that afterwards if you're interested. So who's happy? Good. OK. So what's a collectible is the first thing. Uh, it's something unique that you can, uh, it's either a physical object unique like that or some kind of digitally unique object. So for example, I always carry a Jigglypuff Pokemon card in my wallet with me. Uh, that is an example of a collectible. Uh, technically, my actual ID is also a collectible. If you want to talk about that. Um, Beanie Babies. Hopefully, maybe you've heard of that. Pretty mainstream, I guess. Uh, physical collectibles and maybe a house could be a physical collectible. But the Brooklyn Bridge is not. And if someone t tries to sell you the Brooklyn Bridge, you should not buy it because you cannot own it which is sort of the other thing that has to be uh, there to be able to collect something, is you have to be able to prove that you are the owner of it. So can somebody else give an example of something that could be a collectible that's digital, that isn't crypto, it's not a crypto kitty, and it's not currency related? Anybody? Some, some kind of digital collectible, yeah. A what? Hearthstone cards? Yeah. yeah, okay, that's a good one. Another one? Skins in a video game. Skins in a video game, maybe, yeah. That's it? Okay. <laughs> I was thinking web domains, right? People collect those. Uh, you can prove who owns them. Lots of other, like, lots of video game kind of things. Hearthstone, video game skins, lots of, of things like that. Um, also, stocks in a company. Right, like maybe you own a specific stock or something like that. It's pretty much digital. Um, so, yeah, so what's ERC? So that's, that's a collectible part. So what's an ERC? Um, well, an ERC is the next stage of an EIP. And you can actually see all of the EIPs on github.com slash ethereum slash EIPs. And those are Ethereum improvement proposals. So basically anybody can say, hey, I have an idea for something that could improve Ethereum in some way. And you can make an issue on that GitHub account, uh, that GitHub repo. And whatever issue number that issue is, then that's the number of the EIP. And after we've talked about the EIPs and Maybe you bring it up as like, hey, I have this I general idea, but I haven't really flushed out the specifics. After we've had a discussion online, and a lot of people have put in input and really flushed out the specific details of it, uh, your EIP can graduate to ERC, which all it stands for, ERC, it's not, it's not special, it's nothing technical, it just means Ethereum request for comment. So something that we've thought about and we've published and we said, hey, we think that this could improve Ethereum and we're ready for people to put their input and add comments to it. And that's it. It's really not, uh, it's not anything magical. Um, it's just sort of the stage of an improvement proposal that you're at. Uh, so the first 
ERC idea was in EIP 16, where someone was like, hey, what if we had ERC? And everyone was like, yeah, okay. It's pretty simple. So yeah, so nothing, nothing complicated about that. It's just the number of the improvement proposal that you made. So who's happy? Okay, cool. So ERC 721. So 721, where does that number come from? It's the issue number, right. So it's nothing magical. Uh, and what that uh, issue says is there should be on Ethereum to improve it a standard that allows for the implementation of non-fungible tokens uh, using Ethereum's smart contracts. So that's another buzzword, NFT, uh, nifty, non-fungible. Uh, that's one implementation of a non-fungible token is the ERC721 standard. So the standard includes who owns each NFT, each non-fungible token, how many a person owns, um, if you have many of some tokens uh, that aren't uh, 721s, that are pretty much every single other one, the ERC-20, then probably it has some kind of decimals after it, right? You can send decimals amount. Uh, you can't do that with these. And it does not include any qualities. So the standard is very, very generic and it gives you a way to prove that you own this collectible and to send it and receive it, and that's pretty much it. Everything else is on us as developers on how we want to implement this standard in our own way. So if we want to have Pokemon cards or whatever, then those are qualities of the NFT that we're going to add ourselves. All right, so non-fungible versus fungible. So the standard says it's a standard for non-fungible tokens, right? So what is a non-fungible token? Uh, well, we said before, a collectible, right? My Jigglypuff Pokemon card is a collectible. Um, and the difference between the fungible and the non-fungible is whether they're totally interop interoperable and exchangeable. Uh, so if I have my Jigglypuff card and it is definitely worth one dollar all the time and I bring it into CVS and I try to pay for an Arizona iced tea Arnold Palmer Zero with my Jigglypuff card, what are they going to say? That's right, they're going to laugh at me and then they're going to say no. Uh, so I can pay with a dollar though. And besides, if we forget about the, I, the unique IDs on dollars, that we just pretend it's a dollar in my ATM bank account, every dollar is pretty much the same, right? If I put a dollar into my bank account, it doesn't matter which dollar I get out later. So every dollar to me or to the person taking the dollar as payment, they don't care what dollar it is. They just want a dollar. They don't want a Jigglypuff card. They want something that's fungible. So the dollars are fungible because it doesn't matter which one is which. It doesn't matter which dollar I give to someone. It's about the value of that. And it doesn't matter that my non-fungible Jigglypuff card is the same value because it's unique and it's different. And all Pokemon cards are a little bit different. So I can't pay for things with that. All right. Questions about that so far? Who's happy? All right, good. So, and we have a question at the bottom. So I have lots of questions at the bottom. Um, so what, what's a token standard that is fungible? Yeah, yeah, that's right, yes. And is, is Ethereum, is ETH fungible? Kinda. Kind of, yeah. If, if you send me a little bit, and you send me a little bit of ETH, like, and I send somebody else some, I'm not sending yours or I'm not sending his. I'm just sending some from my pot. Right? So maybe there's a way to track it all very well, but 
it doesn't matter which ETH I send you, right? So it's fungible. So that's the distinction that we're making here. All right, so an ERC typically gives you a list of functions, a list of events, sometimes a list of data structures, and it says, hey, these are the things that you should implement to be part of this standard. So the standard includes three events, uh, two for approvals and one for transferring. So it'll emit uh, an event every time you transfer one of these tokens. It'll say, hey, person A transferred token one to person B, for example. It gives us a balance of function which returns how many NFTs you have at that address of that person. Uh, it also gives us the owner of, which is unique to this standard because we want to know who owns each token, right? You can't own the Brooklyn Bridge, so it can't be an NFT, but you can own each individual Pokemon card or any individual Beanie Baby, and we always need to be able to keep track of who the owner is, which is, uh, the big highlighting theme of the standard is being able to keep track of who owns what. Uh, so these are, these are the functions. There's a couple others that are um, boring, more boring than these ones in, in the standard, but it gives us this list of functions and how we implement them is kind of up to us. So I can implement the owner of function that always returns my ID and says I own everything all the time. And I could still implement that as an ERC-721 standard. It wouldn't be very good. I wouldn't use that. Uh, but you could do that. So the implementation of these functions is up to you. Although it gives you a list of things that they're supposed to, how they're supposed to work. So what are the benefits of everybody using the same function names and the same standard interface for being able to use this token? What is it? Interoperability. Interoperability. That's a hard word. Uh, yes. Yes. So what does that mean? It's a standard that you all agree on, so we can actually move stuff back and forth. We can move stuff back and forth, like with the transfer function. Yeah, transfer. yeah so, but we all agree on it. So what can, what can we do if we all agree on a standard? Generic uh, user interface. Yeah, we can, have, we can have similar user interfaces and we can have a lot of really good third-party applications <coughs> that allow us to trade between different 721. So if we're using the same interface, I can trade my Pokemon cards for Beanie Babies, potentially. Um, so there are lots of third-party services that because we're all using the same standard, uh, they all work very well together. Uh, so here are some cool projects, some things I have implemented the 721 standard that I like a lot. Uh, one of them is Heritage, which is a smart contract platform from uh, the company Airbus, uh, which they are using for tracking donations uh, between charities. So every donation is a unique collectible because it has a specific ID, a specific taxpayer ID, uh, an amount that was donated, and it's a very good way to keep track of who owns that donation, who made that donation. Uh, so that's open source. People are using that for different things, and potentially it could be used for tracking different parts on your assembly line when you're building an aircraft, like Airbus is an aircraft manufacturer. Uh, so it could be used for things like that. Um, like you were saying, interoperability. So because we're using this standard, we can have one central platform or many central platforms or many decentralized platforms where we trade all these different types of tokens. Because the transfer function is the same for each of them, we can trade whatever these are with whatever these are, with kitties, with goddess of nature, with all these different things. So OpenSea is a marketplace for all these different types of tokens, which is really cool because they're all different and they're all made by different people, but we can all, we can trade them all together because they use this nice standard. Uh, so that's fun. Standards are good. 
and we can build more communities because of that. Um, and another, another one is superrare.co, which is all artwork, and they assign a specific artwork uh, and you can buy and sell and trade your artwork online um, and always know who owns it because the standard is very, very good at ownership like we were talking about. So tracking donations, assembly lines, marketplaces for all kinds of games and stuff, art, um, cool things. So is, is there any other, any other cool... NFT project that anyone else has seen that they like? Yeah? I mean, there's the grandfather of them all, which is Pepe Cash. Pepe Cash? Yeah. It was on Counterparty back in 2014. Okay. Yeah. I'll take your word for that. I know. <laughs> um, yeah, so Pepe Cash, art, assembly lines, cool stuff. So when you always know who owns any asset and you're very good at tracking that, there are a lot of different other use cases for that that people might like a lot. Uh, yeah, who's happy? Okay. So the next thing is our description of the technical, description of the implementation. So, like we said in the EIP issue number 721, all right, it gave us this function, safe transfer from, a from address, a to address, a token ID, so I can send from me to my friend, some token, some ID, some specific thing, and transfer the ownership of that. And it also gives us a bunch of cool comments about how this function is supposed to be implemented. So it throws if the person trying to send the token is not the owner of it. So this function will fail, it's supposed to, if the from address is not the owner of the token. So that's good, right? Because you shouldn't be allowed to transfer things that you don't own. I shouldn't be allowed to send his laptop to this guy over here, right? Because it's his. So that makes sense. Uh, so I'm not gonna go through all of these because that would take a long time and be really boring. But if you're interested in the very, very specifics on how all of these work, then you can come here and read all of these different things. And there's only about a dozen functions and events, so it's not too complicated. It's successful, I think, because it's simple enough, simple enough that you could use it for many different things. Okay, so mapping, yeah. So we're transferring how are we keeping track of who owns things? So this is a fungible example of mapping, which is a very specific function to Solidity, which creates a hash table with the first thing in parentheses as the key, a little arrow, and the second thing as the value. So for our fungible, for our ERC20, or our dollar bills in our ATM, this could be a really good way to keep track of things. So we have a key of basically a really, really big Google spreadsheet, right? Where in one row it has everybody's name or their Ethereum address. And in the other row it has how many tokens, how many dollars, how many whatever that person has, whatever their balance is. So we can create a variable called balances of this type hash table with a key of address. I just used my name. And a U integer, an unsigned integer, with some values. And it's important to know that whenever you create a hash table, the default value is always zero. So that's very helpful if we were doing things later that we'll talk about then. Uh, so this will allow every single possible address to come in and be a key and its default value to be zero. So you start off with zero money. Could you set it to a different default value? No. no. Maybe. <laughs> I don't know. I haven't, I haven't seen that before. I... Maybe you, you, could, you could do something 
if you wanted to, but it's probably if everybody if everybody's a superhero, nobody's a superhero, you know. So, uh, yeah. So default value zero, and this is exactly how this is it. This is a basic token <coughs> implementation. And if you wanted to create a fungible token ERC twenty, look, you make your mapping address to uint, keep track of everybody's balances. Done. That's it. That's a basic, the most simple token implementation on Ethereum that you can do. And then you just add a transfer function and you're done. Um, so this is sort of the standard for how tokens were for a long time. And then somebody said, hey, what if I flipped this and I put uint over here and I put address over here? What, what, what would happen? Anybody? Well, you would have a list of IDs of 0, 1, 2, 3, every possible number, and then a list of owners or of addresses of people. So you would give every single token a person associated with it. So that's interesting. Maybe there's something that we can work with there. Uh, so we can also do mappings of special types. So... In JavaScript, you can create your own special types, right, using structs. Um, in C, Java, you create your own classes. So you can do that with Ethereum in Solidity too. So we can create our own class called Pokemon Card. And we can make a mapping of U integers to Pokemon cards. So every ID will have a specific Pokemon associated with it. So ID 0 is a Jigglypuff with attack power 20, which is absurd because Jigglypuff only have attack power 5. Uh, so, yeah, so this is very interesting because we can create our own super unique, it doesn't have to be Pokemon cards, it could be really anything, right? And what is something else, what is another variable that we could put in here besides just numbers an address, we could put an address. What else could uh, a string be? We can have a string that points to something off chain. How could we do that? IPFS. With IPFS, we could do that with IPFS. I was thinking just, we make a string right here, and instead of saying jigglypuff, we make that mywebsite.com slash jigglypuff.jpg, right? So we can have images off chain that we store a URL for, right here, and then every token has its own little picture associated with it. That would be cool. Um, I came up with that all myself, just now. Uh, so so we've, got, we've got a list of all these IDs and all the non-fungible tokens that we want uh, associated with them. So how could we quickly get the owner of those IDs? I'm sorry? With a mapping? Yeah. So like we talked about on the last slide, we could just have a uint and an address here. <coughs> um, and how could we figure out how many tokens an owner owns? We could just have a global variable and just keep track. Like it doesn't have to be uh, magic, right? So we've got a list of all of our cards and we've got another mapping of uint to address. So we've set token zero. The address is jo whatever Joseph's address is. That's me. And so who owns token zero? Joseph, right. And what is token zero? It's a Jigglypuff with an absurdly high attack power. Great. And who owns token one? Abby. And who owns token two? Yeah, whatever that address is. And who owns token three? We haven't made one yet. So if I look up in this mapping, number three, if I put three into my hash table, what do I get? Who's the owner? Zero. 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 Exactly, right. So that's, that's very useful to us. So 
every token that doesn't exist yet, its owner is the zero address, 0x0000000, zero 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 zero, forever, right? Not forever, but like 18 or something, I don't know. Um, so it's very useful for us that the default value is zero because now we have a way to keep track of what tokens have been created or not. So we can always just look up into our mapping, hey, check out this ID, and how would we know if, the, if there's no owner set for that? <coughs> if what? Zero. If address is zero, right. If the, if the value of our key is zero, then it doesn't have an owner yet. So that's very useful for us if we want to create a minting function for creating new tokens. Because if you remember from our standard, um, we, have, we only have a way of sending and receiving tokens. There's no way in this standard, there's no standard way to create new tokens. So there's no mint, there's no mint function. Open Zeppelin gives us one that we'll talk about later, but it only gives us sending and receiving tokens. So if I wanted to implement a create a new token function, how would I be able to do that with only a send and a receive function? If I want, I'm sorry? You can do whatever you want. I can do whatever I want. Well, it's, it'll be like a, a, a company where you issue shares and you have shares on issue. Uh, so a company has a cap table. No, too complicated, too complicated. <laughs> I send, yeah, I send, I just send a new token and I say, hey, it's from zero because zero owns all the tokens that don't exist yet. And I send it to whoever I want to give it to. And that's it, right? So that's, that's our minting is, is just a send from zero. And we know that will always work because we know that the default value in our hash table that's keeping track of all the owners is zero. When you, when you, when you initialize all the tokens, have to have pre-allocated the amount to no. zero? It's a hash table. Okay. So it, these, these rows and columns only exist for the things that we've already implemented. And then otherwise, if we want to check token owners of three, then it's going to look up, it's going to hash that value three to create, a, this is too much. We don't, we don't need to do that. But um, it'll, you can look up hash table implementations and um, the kind of data structure, but it'll look up a unique ID for that and be able to look at whatever memory is in that place without having to allocate it all ahead of time. So this is good. So we, if we want to make new tokens, then we just send from zero because the default is zero. And otherwise, we can look up who the owner is very quickly, and we can look up what each token is very quickly. <coughs> Who's happy with mapping? You're not happy, what's wrong? Do you have a question? Okay. Okay, that's fine. Uh, so let's write some code. Let's take this specification of ERC721 that they gave us, and they gave us all a list of how it's supposed to be implemented, and let's spend the next, I don't know, month trying to write uh, that implementation and doing security audits to make sure it's all very safe and very secure and definitely works and there's no bugs in it anywhere and we'll write all the tests and it'll be a pain and it won't be any fun and we'll all be sad. Or an alternative is we use Open Zeppelin. Open Zeppelin is a really cool uh, smart contract library. I think they're actually presenting today, maybe. I think they were last, there was one last night. They'll definitely be here this week, and I definitely recommend going checking out any talks from the Open Zeppelin team. They'll but be here tomorrow. They'll be here tomorrow? Awesome. So they built a whole bunch of contracts, like so many, that review, that were reviewed by tons and tons and tons of people and everybody put their input in and they came up with the absolute optimal version of the implementation. In my opinion, I'm just some guy, right? So 
uh, they came up with a really great implementation of ERC721. And you can find their code right here, github.com, open Zeppelin, open Zeppelin Solidity. And you can look through all their different tokens yourself and decide if that's the standard that you want to use. Um, and you can also go to openzeppelin.org and, and learn more about their, their APIs and stuff. Yeah? They will be in this room tomorrow at 11.30 a.m. In this room tomorrow at 11.30 a.m. It's going down. So who's happy with Open Zeppelin? I am. Yeah. So 721, they gave us a mint function because they're excellent. And they gave us a couple other useful things. So we already talked about this. How could we implement our own mint function? We just transfer from zero. Uh, that's pretty cool. That's how I would do it. This is how Open Zeppelin. Um, let's walk through this for a second. So this is how Open Zeppelin says you should implement your mint function, or at least this is how they've done it. So they have a function. It takes a two person. It takes an ID. And it says, hey, the two person cannot be zero. And then it calls the add to function. Add to takes this to, takes the token ID, and it says the token owner of this ID has to equal zero. So what does that mean? If the token ID equals if the owner equals zero? <coughs> right, it doesn't exist. It's a new token. And so we can call this mint function on it. It's a new token. Send it. Make the new owner the person two. And then count the number of tokens that person owns and add one and, or whatever else you want to do there. So it makes sure that we're always minting to a person, never to zero, and that we're only minting new tokens if they don't already exist. So that's helpful. Uh, so that's a bunch of code that we didn't have to write because they wrote it for us. But it's also implemented in a way that makes sense, right? It's not too complicated. Um, there's a couple things here. There's a lot of underscores, which I don't really like. I don't know why everybody has to use so many underscores, but okay. Uh, and we're going to do that more later. Yeah, so Open Zeppelin. Build, does all this hard stuff for us and we love them <coughs> and we don't have to implement our own 721 we can just use their implementation and extend it and build our own version of that so like we said before when we were talking about the 721 standard is they haven't given us any data it doesn't include any uh, attack power or type of Pokemon or anything in the standard, it just gives us a really good way to transfer and to keep track of the ownership. So all of that stuff, all the specifics to the token that we want to implement is all on us. And Open Zeppelin has taken care of the really boring part and we can focus on Pokemon and attack power and all that fun stuff. Any questions? Who's happy? Okay, good, a lot of happiness today.